Amen. Thank you for joining me. Uh, good to be here. Today we have a message on the importance and rarity of childlike faith. This is all out of Mark uh, 10. Very powerful uh, scripture that it helps us understand what it means to have faith. And I, I told my wife I was excited to preach this message uh, because it's about kids. And uh, kids, they entertain me. They keep me on my toes. Um, there's just a whole lot of emotion wrapped up in kids and a whole lot of love for kids in our house. Uh, even though, uh, again, they keep us on our toes. We know that we've got three of them here, uh, and we got young and old. So we kind of understand that. And I was just excited to preach, uh, God's word on what, what it means to really have faith like a child and how that's pretty rare and also pretty frail. Uh, and so let's start here today by looking at the personality of a child. Let's dig into the personality of a child. What is he or she like? You know, kids have very prevalent personality traits. And, you know, some, they uh, are quiet, some are loud, some are big, some are small, uh, some are very shy, some are very boisterous and outgoing, and yet they have traits that they share, I think. And no, we never want to completely general uh, generalize here, but they have traits that, that they share. Uh, one I, I just thought of right off the bat was brutal honesty. I was wearing a hat yesterday and my hair was all messed up. And I said, okay, Jenny, you tell daddy, how does his hair look? And uh, she paused and looked at me and said, busted. And she's five. So she said my hair was busted and we enjoyed that. We laughed. Uh, CJ has had a cough and a bad cough kind of all week and it's kind of gotten worse and mom gave him cough medicine early this morning and he was at the breakfast bar eating here today uh eating breakfast and he was coughing and he looked at mom and said this medicine doesn't work you know and he's just so blunt and you just see that brutal honesty and if you know cj he's quiet and if you know jenny she's quite boisterous of course cj's not quiet if he gets to know you but if he doesn't know you he's quite quiet but they're both brutally honest and um in church i would have like to get feedback from people. People know that when I preach, I oftentimes I'll ask a question here and there first to see if you're listening. See, that's how I do that. Uh, but also to see what feedback I can get. You know, the message is about God's word. It's not about uh, me or my family. I use examples, especially self-deprecating examples to add context to the scripture and also show that I can relate to it. I'm not above anyone. Amen. Um, and at the same time, what can I do? You know, if, uh, trying to think of personality traits of kids. I've just got to go to my own kids. So forgive me of that. Understand that if we were in a church house, I would be asking you, you and you and whoever was there, tell me about your kids and their personality traits. I, I get it. You know, you're like, why is you gonna talk about your kids all the time? These are the only ones I'm around a lot. Amen. I'm, I get to be around other kids a little bit, little niece. We get to be around every once in a while. Um, very cute kid. And, and uh, of course, uh, here and there other kids, but for the most part, it's just, especially with COVID and everything. It's just these three kids that I'm around so much. Uh, and of course, how I could relate when I was a child. Three positive traits of children. Again, we're talking about the importance and rarity of childlike faith, childlike faith, what it means to be a child, right? And we're going to get specifically into the idea of young children as well. Three positive. Number one, they're fun loving. Are they not? Kids are fun loving. Little kids are always up for a good time. They love to have fun. They love um, just the basic things, being able to socialize and, and adventure and being able to move around and have fun. And, uh, that's why every kid, I think that ever went to elementary school, their favorite class class was either gym or lunch. Amen. Find me one that says, uh, that doesn't say one of those. Why? Cause in gym they're playing, they're having fun. And at lunch, they're with their friends, they're cutting up and kids, children, young children, they're very fun loving. That's a, that, that's a trait across the board. Uh, young kids that are quiet and reserved, they still love to have fun. Uh, young kids that are outgoing, they love to have fun. Everyone in between, uh, they love to have fun, you know, and they'll just, um, you know, uh, our CJ, our youngest, he'll always go and hide and say, you can't find me, you know, and he'll poke his head up and he just loves to have fun, you know. Uh, energetic. I learned this. Uh, I was told my wife the other day, we're looking at pictures uh, from many years ago. Uh, and I was saying, man, I was so, especially when Kobe was really young, when Kobe, uh, was six, say the kids are five now. So when Kobe was about six, uh, man, I remember being, uh, I would have been much younger then. Amen. That uh, would have been 10 years ago. So I would have been 32. And I remember 
we were at the beach and we had a raft and this kid i would take him out on that little raft a little yellow raft and he would ride the wave in you know and he, again 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 and we would just do that over and over again and i was like man and at that time i felt like i had a ton of energy i was like wow i cannot do this and then of course uh with the kids coming along with jenny especially taking her to sue's uh, cousin in washington dc one year i remember i was absolutely completely spent and i apologized to sue i said i don't know where my energy went and sue's like no that's just parenting it's hard kids are energetic all the day long they really are again they never stop they um they can get tired and dip and take a nap or something but sometimes even when they're not napping and they're tired they get you know they get around something stimulating they're right back at it so kids are energetic and they're very inquisitive aren't they they're curious Again, just this morning, I was just paying attention as I was studying this message to little examples. Um, Jenny was asking her mom, who has uh, an ancestors in Laos, she's uh, ha half Laotian, uh, who lives in Laos. She wanted to know who exactly was there. And uh, CJ, the other day, asked mom, quite frankly, who made the mountains? And so that was a good way to witness to CJ about God. So we see positive traits. I could go on and on, but fun-loving, energetic, inquisitive, these are traits of a young child, amen. I think no matter across the spectrum, these are traits. Negative traits. Kids are bad. And I remember when, when our kids are really little, we would say, very frankly, our kids are bad. And I think we were just pointing out the obvious. They're wild. They're mischievous. They get into stuff. And people are, oh, you can't say that. But I'm just being honest. Uh, let's look. They're ignorant. Number one, they're ignorant. Uh, Jenny was talking about the Pledge of Allegiance this morning, and she didn't even know what it was. She's like, wait a minute. The whole world doesn't live in the United States. Why are we doing that? Uh, they're ignorant. They don't know. They don't know things. Again, CJ is asking who made the mountains. You go on and on. Kids are very ignorant to the ways of the world, and they have a lot of trouble sitting still. Byproduct of all that energy, it's really difficult to sit still. And so we see that uh, in important times, like at church, uh, when we have our proverbs, our family Bible time. You know, they cannot sit still at all, and so it's hard for kids to sit still, and um, it's hard for them to try to be quiet, especially when they're around another child. And then uh, selfish. I first put mischievous, and I changed it to selfish. Children are very selfish, okay? It's one way to identify the sin nature in man is to look at a child with a toy. They fight over toys. There was a whale-type creature that I found in the shed, a stuffed animal. CJ and Jenny were fighting over it this morning to the point where they had a meltdown, and we had to have a family powwow, the three of us, and I had to talk to them how God gave them one another so they could learn to share, and how I had a brother growing up, and I had to learn to share, and how sharing is caring, go through all this, and they're looking at me, I don't know, I mean, they kind of understand it, but until I tell them that they each have a new toy coming, one for one's birthday, one for the other birthday, until I tell them that, they still don't really know what's in it for them. There's an inherent selfishness in them. And so we see great traits and imperfections on this list. And it's important to remember why. And, and this, is, this is amazing because perfect people don't go to heaven. God says, be like a child, have faith like a child. And we see a child's not perfect by any means, right? In fact, they're very imperfect, amen, just as we adults are. Perfect people don't go to heaven. Believers do. And believers are saved by what? By grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. And so children can teach us a very um, deep uh, Bible concept, theological concept. And that concept is we are saved by God. It's his grace through the work of Jesus Christ. It's nothing that we did. Amen. And it's only by the blood of Jesus when we accept him and that free gift of salvation, which we're going to get into in a little bit, that we can be saved. It's nothing that we can do. So identifying negative traits helps us understand that like a child, we are not expected to be perfect. In fact, we cannot be perfect. Look at the characters in the Bible, the real true life historical characters in the Bible. They were not perfect. Abraham was not perfect. Um, David, King David was not perfect. Solomon was not perfect. Uh, he's the wisest man to ever live. He was far from perfect, amen. And there was example after example that God allowed to go into his word. And I'm thinking, if I'm God, all my saints will be perfect in the Bible. God says, no, I'm going to show you imperfection to help you understand the spiritual truth that to be saved, you have to realize you have a need, which is contrary to the idea that you can be saved by being good or doing something good. But how many people today, if you ask them, are you going to heaven? They would say, well, I try to do the best I can. I try to do good deeds. That is absolutely not the way to heaven. And again, we'll get into that in a minute. The belief factor, children are likely to believe the parent or their authority in their life, regardless of physical proof or evidence. And so we get into the belief factor. Why be like a child? Again, you have a faith 
that is like a blind faith, right? Um, again, I've, I've used this example before in church. If I told one of my younger children, uh, even probably the older one, no, no disrespect to him, but if I told them that, okay, tomorrow night, uh, it is going to rain jars of ketchup, okay? And there's going to be ketchup all over the road. Now I need you guys to prepare and wear your raincoats tomorrow night. I mean, at least the two little ones, if not the big one, would be having a raincoat on waiting for the ketchup to fall down. And again, they just believe they have a blind faith. And you can say, Brother Clark, that goes back to ignorance or being young or whatever. But God is saying, you have to believe me. I'm not going to give you evidence. And I'm going to tell you something that's supernatural, that's hard to digest, that's hard to reconcile against all of man's textbooks and theories and all these things. This is called faith, a deep faith. When you believe the parent or the authority, who's our godly parent when we're saved? That's God, uh, Father God, amen. Who's the authority in our life? That's Father God. How do we have access to him? Through Jesus Christ, the one that we accept as Savior. And so here's our text verse today, Mark 10, 14. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Of such is the kingdom of God. Uh, and we're going to get into Mark 10 here. Uh, the context of this verse, the importance and frailty of belief. There's a very important to God that we believe. In fact, we cannot please God. The Bible says we cannot please him if we don't believe. Amen. So there's an importance of belief and it's frail. Amen. You know, you're a child for a season and then you get older and things change a lot. Amen. I, I, I would say I was much different as a child, much different. And, um, we change. And so there's a frailty. There's a season there that you can be saved, I believe, before maybe your heart is hardened. We see that in the Bible over and over again, where people, the Lord out of his mercy, will send witnesses to them, will help give them information, will help uh, try to uh, show them the way, and they'll ignore that. So Mark 10, 1 through 16 here. So this is just the beginning of Mark 10. Our text verse here was Mark 10, 14. So we're going to go Mark 10, 1 through 16. We're going to see this passage, and it's very fascinating how the Lord works within this passage of Scripture, defining broader themes like family. And he arose from thence and cometh into the coast of Judea by the farther side of Jordan. And the people resort unto him again. And he, as he was wont, he taught them again. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart he wrote this precept. But from the beginning of the creation God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh, so then they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no not man put asunder. And in the house his disciples asked him again of the same matter. And he saith unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. And they brought young children to him that he should teach them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought him. Oh, excuse me, that he should touch them. I said, teach them. He brought, they brought young children to him that he should teach them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not for such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms put his hands upon them and bless them. All right. And so we see thematically here in Mark 10, 1 through 16, what's the theme? The theme is family, is it not? The you know God, Again, God wove it into the scriptures so delicately. So many people will skip Mark, the beginning of Mark 10, jump over to, hey, don't forbid these kids from coming to me as our text verse had. And they won't ever look at what was happening. Jesus was over there teaching and preaching, and the Pharisees were trying to tempt him. And they were trying to catch him into uh, some kind of contradiction, I would imagine, and he has to rebuke them. The family is precious to God. We see the line of, of all these things happening. The father and the son represents who God is through the family. I can understand God the son being Jesus and God the father being the father as I am a father and I have a son, and as I used to be a son and had a father. Sacrificial love. You understand that in a family. A lot of times people have to sacrifice for their family, do things they wouldn't do normally. 
And what was the love sacrificially given to us? It was sending his only begotten son, Jesus, to die for us so that we might have life, be born again. Amen. That goes into the bloodline. Family is very important to God. God takes time in his word. Major real estate in the Bible is dedicated to the bloodline. The idea of Jesus coming from this ancestry, which again was very imperfect in a lot of ways. And that shows you who God is willing to use. And that's why Jesus um, is in the line of David. And again, King David was far from perfect. Brothers and sisters, the idea of unification and deep connection. Uh, Jesus does this, so he speaks of this as he was pressed with the crowds. And his, uh, his, I think it was um, his family had come to see him. Uh, brother, sister's mom. I don't remember exactly what the verse is, but they want to see him. And he said, look around here. Uh, those that are here with me, they're my brothers and sisters. And we see that today. Oftentimes in our church, we're closer to people within our church and our church family and believers than we are with our biological relatives. We see love in family. There's a deep kind of love and commitment in the family picture. We see here Jesus teaching about the husband and the wife being one flesh. What does that mean? That means prioritization of husband to wife over parents, especially when conflict occurs. When you're young and you get married and now you ha are the husband and you have a wife or you are the wife and now you have a husband, that relationship takes precedence over the relationship with your family. Yes, you're still to respect your family, honor your parents and so on and so forth. But the top priority now is you guys, you two. And guess what? You two are one flesh. I heard this preached many times. I really enjoy this idea that when we get married, we become one flesh. And if we are mean to our spouse, if we are stealing from our spouse, if we are hurting our spouse, if we are abusing our spouse, we are mean to ourselves. We are hurting ourselves. We are abusing ourselves because we are one flesh. And so there are times when uh, maybe in marriage that I won't want to do something, you know, I'm, I'm tired and I know Sue's tired and maybe a dish needs to be clean or something needs to be put away or the kids need to shower. And there are times I have to remind myself if I am taking loafing here for my comfort and hurting her, I'm really hurting myself. And that's a good way to put others before yourselves when it comes to marriage. And we see that explained here. And we see the sacredness of marriage. And why is the sacredness of marriage so important? The idea of entering into the marriage as a chaste virgin, the idea of being one and not committing adultery, because we're the bride of Christ. And so you have the literal idea of not committing adultery, not cheating on one another. And then you have this bigger spiritual idea that when we are saved by Christ, we shouldn't be adulterers living in the world, chasing fleshly sin, pretending like God doesn't see it when he clearly does. And that infuriates him. Amen. Sadly, this is funny here. The disciples had to ask, okay? So the Pharisees, you know who they are. They're trying to trick Jesus. They're trying to, they hate him. They want to kill him. They feel like their rules and their laws are being disrupted. Their power is being disrupted. Uh, they, 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 they have animosity towards him. They're trying to throw him a curveball. Uh, and then what happens, right? Well, his disciples, they go in the house after he answers publicly and they say, uh, Jesus, master, teacher, now, what is this again? We don't really understand either. Now, can we be divorced? Can we not? It's sad, but it shows again just how fallen we all are and that we need the Lord desperately, that we can't even figure it out when he's right in front of us sometimes. They were confused about the doctrine of marriage for life. And now we see the latter parts of Mark of, of Mark 10 working into uh, children. And so we see this great theme of family and the importance of family, and not cheating on family, not hurting family, and being one one flesh, husband and wife. And then we see uh, the children, young children. You know, they mention young children in the scripture, uh, and 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 I think that's very important because you know someone that is sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, you may still call them a child. Like say someone's eighteen, but they live at home and they're a senior in high school, you still probably call them a child. But they're much much different than say someone that's three, four, five, six, or seven. And I think that that's very important to understand that these young children, they're not at the age of accountability yet. They don't know everything. Amen. Uh, not that an 18 year old does, but an 18 year old has a lot more uh, perspective and opinion and I would say propensity to uh, disbelief than a young child does. And we see this here, um, verse 13 of Mark 10, and they brought young children to him, very important, young children, that he should teach, uh, touch them. Now, why would 
Jesus touched them. I can think of two ways, either one to heal them. Remember in the Bible, Jesus often touched and healed. And the other one would be to bless them, to, to pass on a blessing to them. And and that, I mean, to be blessed by God would be incredible to be touched and blessed by God, even though when we're saved, that's what happens to us. Amen. We're forever kept. Uh, so we see touched, why blessing or healing by Jesus, refused by the disciples. There was a crowd there and the disciples probably were saying, no, nobody's getting in to see Jesus Christ right now. And Jesus says, these are special. And so we see here that, that children, yes, they're an example of the rarity of faith and the frailty of faith. They're also an example of um, how God loves kids and children. I believe uh, that there are many scriptures that prove this, the idea uh, of pure religion is taking care of the widows and the fatherless. Um, that is that it would be better to have a millstone um, around your neck and the and you know be drowning in the ocean than to hurt one of these children's uh, children children's one of these children. So, children are special to God. They're very special. Now let's contrast this with the adults in Scripture. The adults have hard hearts. Think about what they were asking. Now, of all things they could ask, they want to ask Jesus, "Can we get rid of our wife?" Basically. And they have hard hearts because of unbelief. Think of the Pharisees. They didn't really believe. If they believed he was who he said he, said he was, they would have treated him with reverence. They would have been afraid. They would have feared God instead of trying to trap him and, and snare him. Now, I believe some Pharisees were saved. Amen. Uh, we know that from Scripture. And I believe that, that they did see something in him that was godly and like a deity. And so it was probably a challenge for them to also try to trap him. But either way, they were asking these questions. And we see that unbelief is the root of it. And I, I want to take a scripture here that details unbelief from Exodus. You know, the Exodus story, the Israelites were in bondage in Egypt. They uh, were trapped. Uh, the Lord made a way. Pharaoh and the army is coming to get them. Lord splits the Red Sea through Moses. They pass over on dry land. Then that water collapses on the Egyptians that were pursuing them to try to kill them and wipes them all out. They're free. Now they're going to go to the promised land, to Canaan land, but they still, even though they had witnessed these miracles of God, they still had unbelief in their hearts. And it was really great unbelief. And we see that in Exodus 24, uh, 12 through 18. And the Lord said unto Moses, come up to me into the mount and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments, which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And Moses rose up and his minister Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of God. And he said unto the elders, tarry ye here for us until we come again. He told, told the elders to wait. And he said, behold, you know, Aaron and her are with you. And if any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. Aaron being Moses' brother, right? Saying, just go to him if you got an issue. And Moses went up to the mount and a cloud covered the mount and the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai. And the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud and the sight of the glory of the Lord they saw the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. They literally see God, okay? Keep that in mind. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. What's that a picture of? Time of testing, right? Time of trial. Jesus was tempted uh, in the desert, 40 days and 40 nights. He was fasting. He was tempted of the devil. Uh, he walked the earth after uh, his resurrection, 40 days and 40 nights. And so Moses is up there, a trial is occurring, we see, and then if you jump, so this was Exodus 24, you jump to Exodus 32, 1 through 4, we see what the people did as they kind of got antsy there. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down, remember he's up there 40 days, 40 nights, of the mount, the people gathered themselves together, it's always dangerous when you get together and you think you got an idea, and they went to Aaron, or unto Aaron, and said unto him, and Aaron being Moses' brother, the guy in charge while Moses is up there on the mount with God, and said unto him, up, get like get up, Aaron. Make us gods which shall go before us. For as this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. Okay, so first here they they're not even saying God brought him out. Oh, Moses did. No, no, God brought him out through Moses. That's important. And secondly, they've seen God in the cloud. They know God is with him. God has been raining manna down from heaven, feeding them. Not one of their shoes wore out. Amen. And, and, and so they, they see God everywhere, and they're saying, uh, Aaron, you need to get up, and you need to make us some gods. We're getting a little antsy over here. We need something to worship. Verse 2, And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, 
of your sons and of your daughters and bring them unto me. Now, if you understand the Exodus story, uh, when they left, all the plagues in Egypt uh, had taken place. And so when they left, uh, people were dying literally to get them out because they didn't want the plagues. And they realized that God was judging them because they wouldn't let the Israelites leave because the Israelites were slaves, say basic, basically. Uh, and so they gave them gifts. They gave them gold and jewelry, which I, as I understand, a lot of it went to go build some of the finer things in the ta- uh, in the tabernacle and so forth, in the Holy of Holies and all. But I had these golden earrings so they could make them into an idol. Verse 3, and, and all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And I encourage you to read uh, Exodus 32. Read all of Exodus, but certainly read 32 onwards. See what God does with, with these unbelieving people. It's not good. And it's five and a half weeks or so, and they're in complete unbelief after they've literally seen God, and now they're worshiping idols. Now, here's the question for you. Are we any better today? I think we'd be worse. I think we'd be worse. I think we would witness God and see him, and it would take us only a few days to start worshiping idols, not even weeks or whatever it is. If it took them a few days, it'd take us a few hours. It is unbelief that leads the sinner to hell, not their sin, which was paid for on the cross at Calvary. Which brings me to the second point. The idea here is that it's not anything we can do other than believe. And we've been giving, given a free gift that's been paid for. We just need to accept it. If I came to your door, which I like using this example in the days of COVID and the internet and all these things, who comes to your door anymore? How many random knocks do you get at the door? The only people we typically see at our door are either uh, our neighbor or we usually see them in the driveway or something, or um, uh, UPS, you know, delivering a package, right? Or uh, maybe a contractor or someone that's lost. Well, you don't really get anyone coming to your door. So if I'm knocking on your door, this big old bearded dude, just knock, 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 you open the door and I say, I've got an offer for you. I have a free gift for you. And I'm holding a box with a ribbon on it. I say, would you like to accept my free gift? And I'm telling you all these grand things about this free gift. Now, you have a choice. You can close that door and say, this is really odd. I'm not going to do this. This doesn't go with what's happening in society, with what other people are doing, with with my better intellectual judgment. I'm just going to say no. And that's what people often do with salvation. They just say, yeah, I mean, you're asking me to really believe a lot here, that I'm a sinner, that I have a need for a Savior. That's very offensive. That God came down in the flesh, and instead of just ruling and reigning, he came down humble and meek, and he suffered and was obedient even unto death. He let people kill him and brutally kill him on the cross. That's a lot to think about. And then he was actually risen from the grave. I've never seen anyone resurrected. I don't know about that. And then he walked the earth 40 days and then 40 nights and, and was seen by over 500 and ascended up to heaven and is at the right hand of the Father, and he lives today. And I, gotta, I can have a personal relationship relationship with him. That's pretty hard to believe. I I don't want that free gift. See, even though it's a free gift, if you have not accepted it, you cannot be saved. You have not accepted it. Why? Because of unbelief. The same unbelief, here you have the Israelites here in the Exodus account where Moses is up there on the mount with God saying, give us something to worship. We, we, We know this is getting serious here and make us some golden molten calves. Awful. Uh, the offer, uh, the offer here is not some, um, little thing. It is the finished work of Jesus. So what does the offer God through the work of Jesus? What is he making the sinners? He's saying, I'll save you. If you believe I'll do the heavy lifting, I'll do everything. And by the way, that's how faith works. Once you're saved too, it's not what we do. Oh God, if I could just do a little bit more. No, no, you need to believe a little bit more. And how do you believe? The Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing uh, in the word of God, amen, by the word of God. And so if you don't get, if you just ignore the Bible, you then would be ignorant, right? And if you ignore the Bible and then you don't accept that free gift of salvation, you cannot plead ignorance because you could say, I never knew God. And God will say, I gave you a book. Can you imagine being in a high school math class and coming in and there's a test and you say, I can't take this. I don't know anything. And the teacher says, well, I gave you a textbook. And you say, well, I didn't read it. What, what kind of grade are you going to get? Is the teacher going to say, oh, you didn't read it? Oh, you get a pass. You get an F because you know better. And the same way. 
And, and God said, and you're saying, well, how do I know? There's all these different beliefs and religions. God says nature testifies to him. In his word, prophecy, many prophecies, hundreds of prophecies have already been fulfilled. That means that there was something stated about the future in the past that ends up happening over and over and over. And the devil's job is to make you not look into this stuff, to keep you distracted and busy, and to keep you yoked up in the world culture, which tells you you don't need this. And so that free offer of salvation is available to everyone. God wants all to be saved. The scripture says God desires all to come to repentance. And if it's declined, it's typically, as I understand it, pride and unbelief. And these things go hand in hand. People love to be the captain of their own ship, don't they? They love to be in full control. And the world tells them you can be in full control. The world tells them get a good job, get a great education, have everything you've ever wanted, be happy, and don't worry about that thing called death. There's You'll turn into a butterfly or you'll turn into a caterpillar or whatever it is. That's what the world tells you. I'm telling, I mean, there are, there are videos online with millions and millions of views telling you this garbage, this new age garbage, which completely does not line up with the, with what we're living in. And the Bible completely tells us, which was written thousands of years ago, exactly where we'd be in these last days. And you just cannot please God without faith. The Bible says, uh, Hebrews eleven six is impossible uh, to ple- please God without faith. So if you have faith, like a child, honest, earnest faith, The reward is sweet. It's everlasting life and a closeness with God. And all you have to do is believe. The work has been done. Calvary is not in the future. Calvary is in the past. Amen. The book of life, it's not like it's not there. It's already there. You know, and so if you haven't been saved, now is the time to be saved. And if you think you're saved, but you're living like the world, now's the time to evaluate, am I really saved? I'm not trying to preach you out of your salvation, but I want you, the Bible tells us to work our salvation out with fear and trembling. I want you to focus on it. Go to God, go to the throne room boldly, ask him uh, to come into your heart, ask him to forgive your sins. I don't think God minds us being extra careful about salvation, which he's presented to us, which the world seems to throw out and care nothing about. There are many that say they trust the Lord. What is, what is the, Someone could look this up. What is the percentage of Americans that claim, percentage of American adults or whatever that claim to be Christians? 50, 60, 70%. It's going down. And the rate of those that cl- call themselves nuns or or agnostics or atheists is going up. But there's still the majority of Americans, as I understand it, and someone could uh, leave a comment, let me know, uh, they're still Christian. They're still Christian. They call themselves Christian. But there are many that say they trust the Lord, but they have no knowledge of him. They're false converts. I mean, think about this. If you have no knowledge of God, what kind of faith are you showing? Because guess what? When you get in this word, especially in that Old Testament, you read about a fearful God. Look at God's judgment on the Israelites. He did that to make them an example. Look at God's judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. A a, a grievous sin was being committed there, homosexuality. That is still something that God is an abomination to God. I don't care what the world says. It is. It's true. And God he blew them up. He wiped them out. He saved one family, Lot and his daughters. Even Lot's wife didn't make it because she was looking back reminiscing. God is saying, I did that for an example. God could, because again, it's not like, oh, God couldn't wipe out any kind of group or organization or area right now. He could if he wanted to, but he is long suffering. He wants all to come to repentance. And there's scripture on that in the book of Corinthians, the idea that some of you used to be uh, feminine and all these things, but now you're not, and that, and nobody that is will enter the kingdom of God. It's true, amen? You have to repent. You have to give it to God. People say, I was born like that. That is not an excuse. I was born to like to eat. If I eat all the time, I'm going to get sick, amen? I was born to uh, enjoy uh, cars. I like cars, okay? I don't know anything about how to fix them, but I think cars are neat. I love cars. Um, it's no excuse for me to have 15 cars in the garage and say, well, I was just born like that. Our, our ways about us are inherently bad and evil. Amen. Our flesh, the Bible describes our heart being wicked beyond measure uh, that no one can really even understand it. And we need to understand that we are wicked, born in sin in order to be saved. And if we never have that understanding, whether it's one sin or another, covetousness, idolatry, uh, uh, homosexuality, um, you know, fill in the blank, lying, murdering, all these things. We need to get right with God, not that we're perfect. A child is not perfect either. We need to have childlike faith, understanding our need, asking him to forgive us, and then we can be saved. Can you think of why believing is so hard for the world today 
And I put teens in here too, because teens are growing up very fast. I've seen statistics that show what they've seen on their phones and what they're into. I was a teenager not that long ago, amen, 20 some years ago. I guess it was a while, but it was, I know what I saw as a teenager, what I got into, amen. And by the grace of God, he got me out. Can you think of why believing is so hard for teens and adults today? It's because the world system focuses on instant gratification, self-sufficiency from God, the idea of evolution. Oh, we can explain how we got here. Education. Oh, we can learn everything and make it all better. Materialism. uh, Things and objects can make us happy, right? That's what the Israelites were saying to Aaron, Moses' brother, saying, make us some cows. We'll worship them. And if this God over here in the cloud is up on the mountain with Moses, we don't know what's going on with him. We'll just worship these cows. You know, hey, just give me a professional sports team. I'll worship that. Just give me a, give me a, a, a bank account. I'll worship that. Just give me a, a person, a celebrity. I'll worship that person. And you say, well, that's crazy. Well, look how much of that goes on here today. You have fanatics, people that are so crazy about sports. It takes the top point in their life. You have celebrities, people that are obsessed with celebrities. It takes the top point in their life. You have people that are materialists that think that they can buy their way into happiness and they they get the dream house. That's not enough. They get the pool. That's not enough. They get the car. That's not enough. They get the dog. It's not enough. They get, 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 get. And yet they never have. So that brings us back here to the start. How can someone enter the kingdom of heaven? They have to believe like a child. Why the child is the perfect model for true faith. And this is going to wrap it up here. The innocence of a child. Child, children are inherently innocent. Young children, a lot of times they don't know. See, we got a um, a little uh, lighthouse. We stayed at a state park in South Carolina, Hunting Island State Park there. It's a beautiful park. Number one uh, visited park in the state of South Carolina. I didn't know that until maybe last year, a year before we started uh, visiting that park on day trips. And we, we got to spend uh, a couple nights there in the park. And there was a, there's a beautiful lighthouse there, gorgeous. And so we went to the gift shop and we got the smallest little lighthouse, you know, $5 or something. But still, it's at the gift shop in the park. It's like four or five hours away from where we live. We get this little lighthouse. We put it on our little uh, um, TV stand, so to speak, in our living room. And CJ, my youngest son, takes a blue crayon and just starts drawing all over it when I'm not around. Uh, and and uh, I, I said, what on earth? Like, why would you do that? We can't get another one of these lighthouses. I was teasing mom. I, hey, we're going to have to go back and get it. But uh, we can't get it. And CJ looked at me just kind of nonchalant, just kind of honest and said, oh, I didn't know. I just wanted everything to be blue. I, I didn't know. And that's the truth. He, he probably did not know. There, there's an innocence there, even when he misbehaves. And there's also an innocence there. You know, you tell the child you're happy to see them and they'll say, I'm happy to see you. You say, I love you. They say, I love you too. There's just an innocence there. There's an earnest nature there. They're, they're they're also willing to face rebuke and chastening. They realize their imperfections. They realize the need for rebuke and chastening. And that's the perfect model for true faith. You have innocence. You have a willingness to face rebuke and chastening. The Bible in Proverbs speaks about how we must be willing to be rebuked and that we'll be blessed. We'll be uh, very blessed by, by facing rebuke, godly rebuke. The willingness to learn uh, a new and better way. And that is the idea that they don't think they have it all figured out. Little kids kind of realize they need mom and dad and, you know, they, they need to learn a better way. When we get up in this world, a lot of times, and I don't know why, but you're in a city or something like that, you kind of think you got to figure it out. You don't have, someone tells you, no, you need to get right with God and forsake all of these idols and all this sin. They're going to think, what are you crazy? I, I know what I'm doing. I know what makes me happy. And I can go listen to Oprah and she'll tell me I'm okay the willingness to learn a new and better way, the sincerity of a child. You know, oftentimes, again, not always, I know they can be tricky, but the sincerity of a child, they're not trying often to deliberately trick or steal. Uh, They're sincere, amen, they're sincere. When they say yes, typically it's yes. When they say no, typically it's no. And again, yes, I know. Hey, did you uh, spill that drink? Oh, no, I didn't. You know, they're scared they're going to get whooped or something. And yes, they did. I know it's not always there, but typically a child is very sincere. Again, you tell them that they love you or you love them and they tell you that they love you. They're, they're being sincere. They tell you they're not tired or they tell you they are tired. Yeah, they may be trying to stay up, but generally you just kind of take them at face value. And when we become little children before God, we are invited to partake in his fellowship. And that starts with salvation. We are God saying, you're not perfect. I get that. Okay. I know the world intimately. I created it. I'm all around it. 
And by the way, I entered it through the person of Jesus Christ. I know, I know the world. I know sin. Now, I didn't sin at, through Jesus, you know, God would say, but I know sin very well. God's not saying be perfect. He's saying, come to me with faith. And then a child once born is dead, uh, twice born is made alive new in Christ. And so we were born, we are spiritually dead. And that's the idea of not having the Holy Spirit living within us, never accepting Christ. Uh, All these little things that that are these rituals that are done at birth that does not save us. Amen. We need to have that, be of that age of accountability. What is the age of accountability? I don't know. I would say teenage years would be my guess. Amen. Is the age of accountability. Maybe, Maybe early adulthood. These little kids don't know, so I believe they'll be with uh, Jesus Christ in heaven because he actually says that's what you need. That's how you need to be to be in heaven. So I I imagine he they have admission to heaven, Amen. Uh, But as we get older, especially those teenage years, we need to realize that we are spiritually dead until we accept Christ as Savior, and that's how we get into His kingdom. And to be truly born again, we must accept His free gift of salvation in sincerity and soberness not a flash of emotion or a get out of jail type manner. Uh, children often little children often around their parents, they're in the house all the time. They're not really in a rush, you know. Uh, you, you want to do something with a child, they've got all day, you know, they're there all the time. And we have to have that kind of sincerity and soberness where we say, you know, Lord, we're willing to make a commitment to you. We're not going to just okay, we're facing some terminal illness and now we'll accept you, though the Lord will save you at that time. But just generally speaking, amen, what we want to do is have faith and not put it off. We will say, well, maybe later I'll do this. I'll dive into this later, but have faith now. Um, and and yeah, I mean, if you've been watching this video this long, I don't think you're putting it off. You're doing good. I appreciate you watching uh, all this. But that's the idea. To truly be born again, we must accept this free gift of salvation in sincerity and soberness, not in a flash of emotion or a get out of jail type manner. To conclude, there is a season to everything in life. There is. There's a season to everything in life. Now is the season to accept Christ as the harvest approaches. The harvest is approaching. When the end times come, it'll be too late. The tribulation is not the time to be saved. We want to be saved now in the church age before the rapture. That means when the rapture comes, you have to go to heaven and be with Jesus and things are perfect. Well, literal hell starts breaking out on earth. Yes, you could be saved in the tribulation, as I understand it, but you're going to have to refuse the mark of the beast. You won't be able to eat, buy, sell, or do anything, and you'll be beheaded. And again, my theory is it's going to be hard. I don't don't think there's going to be preachers there preaching to the Gentiles. There could be, but I, I think mostly it's going to be uh, to the Jews at that time, God turning his attention back to the Jews with 144,000 male uh, virgin Jews preaching uh, the gospel message, amen, and, and we will be gone, uh, those that are saved. Childlike faith saves us, true sincere belief, void of pride and self-earning. There's nothing we can do to earn it. Uh, nothing we can do other than believe. Childlike faith keeps us close to God. Uh, a belief that God's word is true will keep you in the word, would it not? Childlike faith should have us desiring to serve him by telling everyone uh, we can about what his son did for us on the cross. That is the idea. We are to be one to the Lord. We are to be saved. And then we are to walk with him. And that is going to drive us to work for him. We are going to have a desire. If you have no desire to serve God, you need again, really check and make sure that you have accepted him as Savior and Lord, because when you accept him as Savior and Lord, you'll have that burning desire to tell others about Jesus. You'll want them to have what you have. Faith in God should drive a healthy Christian walk, which involves Bible study. Again, building that faith, prayer, praying without ceasing, service, serving the Lord. Faith without works is dead, as the book of James says. And then all of these things, Bible study, prayer, and service, they're going to naturally evolve and lead to evangelism. So evangelism isn't born out of someone that is lost and they say, well, I'll try to do this. It's not born out of someone that is saved and they're trying to like, okay, I don't know what to do. Typically, it is born out of obedience. Evangelism is born out of obedience. I believe that. So it's not that someone becomes an evangelist and then gets on fire for God. It's someone gets on fire for God by reading his word and by seeing him him in their lives and by having that personal relationship with Christ and by walking close to the Lord and by praying without ceasing, being obedient. The Bible says, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so under how can we keep his commandments if we don't know them, amen? Keeping his commandments, learning them, and then keeping them, knowing them, living for him sincerely. And that is the idea of Mark 10 on how to be saved the importance and rarity of childlike faith 
It comes from that belief, that sincere, sober, kind, loving, innocent belief, not perfect as we know, that that is how we are saved. I thank you so much for listening. I ask you please to consider accepting the Lord here today if you haven't. And if you have, renew your commitment to Christ today to serve him and to live for him. Thank you so much. Take care. God bless and amen.